I thought I'd share with you five of my favorite books on classical teaching and performing, which have really uh, helped me with my own teaching and playing of, uh, of classical music. So the first one up is Chopin, Pianist and Teacher, as seen by his pupils. Now, I totally love this book because it's one of the only ones that I know of anyway, that is a collection of all the things that Chopin's students wrote about him and the music he was playing, the music he was writing and how he was teaching. So it really gives you an inside look into what kind of a teacher Chopin actually was. And the thing I love about it, as you can see, is lots and lots of musical examples. It's all incredibly detailed with all the footnotes and things that you might want as well. But it really goes into depth into how he actually taught. So I've just picked a few little pieces here that I can show you. And the thing that is, is really instructive about this is that if you are learning one of the etudes or a polonaise or a mazurka or whatever it is, you actually go in here and look it up by reference and by the index and actually see what he said about playing this piece. So for example, if you take his etude, Opus 25, number one in A flat major, which sounds a bit like this. No doubt some of you have taught or played this one. It's said that Chopin explained to one of his pupils the manner in which this study should be executed. Imagine, he said, a little shepherd who takes refuge in a peaceful grotto from an approaching storm. In the distance rushes the wind and the rain while the shepherd gently plays a melody on his flute. How evocative is that? I mean, it's the kind of thing that you could say to a student or you could uh, consider when you're playing this piece that would just bring a completely new light to that performance. And then again, for some of the scherzi, for example. So if you have a look, take his scherzo in B flat minor, one of the pieces I've always enjoyed exploring, right from the beginning, that repeated triplet group motif. It sounds a bit like this. And as the book says, so innocent seeming could never be played to Chopin's satisfaction. This is one of his students speaking. He says, it must be a question taught Chopin, and it was never played questioningly enough, never soft enough, never round enough, he said, never sufficiently weighted. It must be a house of the dead, he once said in his lessons. <laughs> I thought, ah, absolutely. This is one of the things that even my own teachers have picked up when I've been playing this little phrase. And maybe you as a teacher have gone, ah, oh, it's still not quite right when your students are playing it. So that's the first book. It is such a great reference for anyone performing and exploring the music of Chopin and anyone teaching it too. Walter Gieseking on piano technique. Now I was referred to this, or I was given this by one of my teachers actually. Now Gieseking, he was a contemporary of Prokofiev, Shostakovich, Debussy even, died about 1950 something. And he was quite well renowned as a performer in his day of Debussy in particular, with a particular touch that he had. And this book talks about his uh, take on piano technique. Um, and as you can see, I've made uh, an absolute heap of notes and things like that. It's got a great number of examples, how he taught, uh, what he thought of teaching, and exactly how to approach technical challenges. Now, some people, I mean, he, he was an advocate of the finger technique, which, which advocated a lot of finger movement and less arm movement. So I think anyone that's looking at technique books like this uh, needs to take it from a balanced perspective. Uh, and that's why I just read as much on technique as I possibly can, because it's one of those things that I don't really prescribe to a Russian technique or an American technique or uh, European traditions, whatever it is. I try and take the best of what I can find wherever it is. And so while any technique book, maybe you don't follow it 100% to the letter, you can get so much from it. So for example, he talks about the trill here. The acquiring of a round and even trill is to a very great extent dependent on the ear and on the relaxation of the muscles. The secret of this is, as has been already said, in keeping one's ears open. But I practices the trill eight to 10 times. And then over the page here, I do not recommend the practice of special trill exercises, but I have my pupils study thoroughly, for instance, the sarabands from Bach's French Suite in E major, by means of which most of my pupils acquire a faultless trill. So he talks a lot about the way he uses repertoire to engage technique as well. So uh, another interesting book for you, that's uh, Walter Gieser King on piano technique. The next one's Boris Berman's um, biography. It's called Notes from the Pianist Bench. I actually saw Boris come to Melbourne, it must have been about 2008, to work at ANAM, the Australian National Academy of Music, and I went to see him run a masterclass. 
and it was mind-blowing. Uh, and so I thought, oh my goodness, I have to go and get his book. If you're not familiar with um, him as a performer, he's well-renowned for Prokofiev in particular, but, um, you know, it was just extraordinary when he was uh, performing, uh, sorry, working with these students on these master classes and just able to play anything from memory perfectly. It was just, you know, makes you really wonder how on earth you're going to get there yourself. But I did learn so much from it. And so I, here's a couple of things that I picked up from, from this. So he, he divides it into sections. So there's, there's a, uh, a chapter on time, for example, a chapter on pedaling, chapter on practicing, deciphering the composer's message, seeing the big picture. You get the kind of idea there. Uh, here he's talking about the pedal. Too often the left pedal is used merely as a mute when its main purpose should be to add a special color or sonority. In principle, the left pedal should not be treated as a life vest to be used whenever one cannot reduce the volume enough. And we see students using it like that all the time. And a lot of the time, even teachers aren't quite sure that or don't realize the depth of change in the sound that can be achieved through the unicorda, the, the soft pedal. Uh, and so I think it's really important to that students know that it's not just if it says PP, then hit the left pedal. It's more that it does actually change the sound and the sonority. And then he had three questions as well that he wanted all students to ask themselves all the time. And Robert Duke as well, when I interviewed him on my podcast, he's a huge advocate of this, getting students to listen to what they're doing think about what they want to create and the sound they want to achieve and then redoing it and trying to achieve that. So he has this three step, three question process that students should ask themselves, how do I want it to sound? Does it sound the way I want? If not, what should I do to make it sound the way I want? And he goes into detail a little bit more about that. Uh, one interesting thing I circled here is he says, I'm skeptical about practicing in rhythms. Now I've always been an advocate of practicing in rhythms. So this is where you have a, a tricky filigree passage uh, of running quavers or semi-quavers and you purposefully accent accent different groupings. So you could accent the first of every group of four semi-quavers or 16th notes, or you just play them in rhythm, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, or da, 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 da. Now I've always advocated this. I've used it with my students. I've used it with my own practice. I think it's a tried and true way of ending up with a really well-known passage. I use it myself as well, but I know that's controversial. Not everyone does the same thing. He says, I do not see any merit in practicing unevenly what ultimately has to sound even and vice versa. And he talks more about his approach and what he does instead in this book. So great book uh, that I recommend to you as well. That's Boris Berman's Notes from the Pianist Bench. Daniel Barenboim's biography. Uh, and it goes right through his life starting as an extraordinarily talented uh, young pianist to his life as a conductor later on. And I've always loved his playing, particularly of Beethoven. I think he's one of the best exponents um, of Beethoven. And he goes into detail all the different stages of his, of his life. Uh, and then into uh, particularly interesting, I think, is his uh, chapters on interpretation and um, also a, a number of the elements of musical history he goes into because as a conductor, one of the aspects I think that you really get depth in, uh, and I haven't been a classical conductor, so I'm not sure, but this is what I think, is that you really get depth of interpretation and understanding of um, the background of the piece and you get really deep into it. On performing, he says, one of the dangers of playing in public is to be too conscious of the audience. In other words, you must not go on stage thinking you're going to impress them, nor with a strong wish to project this or that. I think the best communication between artist and audience occurs if the artist becomes unaware of the public as soon as he or she starts playing. Much easier said than done, um, Daniel, uh, might I say. Um, he also says, the independence of the fingers is all important and I can only recommend with great emphasis that pianists should constantly work at the fugues from Bach's well-tempered clavier. Having played a few of them myself, I know that that is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily challenging thing, but I do understand how useful it can be. And he talks about um, his teachers, Aral, for example, and, and what he picked up from each of his teachers. Uh, etc. So another great book, well worth having a read, particularly if you like his performing. The last one is called What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body by Thomas Mark. Have you seen this one before? This is a really interesting book and completely different to the other ones. This is uh, kind of like an anatomy book for pianists. And I was given this uh, very early on when I started teaching and it really did help me understand how to get students to sit 
how the muscles uh, and tendons and things of the body and arm work. For example, we talk about things like the carpal tunnel. What actually is that? Why is there an issue with that? What causes issues? How we need to stay in neutral positions and not at the um, edges of our movement. Um, how to sit right. All the different muscles and, and of the arms and all this. It's really, really interesting uh, and well worth a read. I did lots of um, highlighting and uh, dog earing of different pages like this one about sitting on where the sit bones are whether we should be forward or back so I think these are the kinds of questions that teachers are always asking themselves am I teaching this the right way when we when we consider technique sh you know, should we be moving our arms should we be staying quite still what if you know finger joints are bending backwards all these questions we're always questioning whether we're doing things the right way and I think one of the ways to feel more confident as a teacher is to be widely read, read more books, get more opinions from different people and pull it all together and then feel confident in your own approach. So there you go, my top five classical teaching and performing books for you as part of the celebration for September's Classical Music Month. I would love to know, have you got some favorite books as well? Leave a note in the comments there. Make sure you subscribe if you've enjoyed this one and I'll see you again soon.